evening, everyone. Welcome to the Rational Radicals show. Uh, just heard from Skip. He said he's having some computer issues. Let's uh, let's pray. Let's send out our thoughts and prayers. Hopefully he can uh, work that out soon. His presence is absolutely and definitely missed. Um, this, of course, is the Rational Radicals show every first and third Wednesday of every month. Me and Skip live and direct to talk to, with, and about people, the people them. So I'm very happy to be here. We have an interesting topic, and I really want to hear from y'all as much as y'all want to hear from me on this issue. Because me, I think the issue in terms of uh, powerful blacks versus black power, or what I was going to call this show was the successful black man syndrome, but this isn't really limited to black men. So I just put it down there under the at. But um, again, I need to hear from y'all as much as y'all because y'all, y'all, I mean, the community confused me on this. So let's talk about it. Y'all know if you've seen the cover photo, y'all know who I'm talking about. And I don't know if y'all watched the Bro Diallo show in concert, but when I went live, uh, when I went live, uh, I said that I hadn't seen people making the same excuses for P. Diddy uh, that I saw for R. Kelly, Bill Cosby, Farrakhan, or any uh, Kanye West, Barack Obama. Whenever there is a successful or powerful black man, the type of excuses that are made for this successful, powerful black man under oppression because um, this thing that I explained to the black community, because we are all victims of white hegemony, we are all victims of global white domination and capitalism and the historical and contemporary abuses by the very system we are subject to. So because we all know we are, there's not one black person who has been exempt, even the, the confused Negro Uncle Tom handkerchief head uh, Coons, who said, you know, I, I've been in the same room with Negroes. I, white people treat me better than my own people. I don't know those experiences. They even went to like Vivica Fox. And when they were asking her about the pay discrepancies in Hollywood, and she was like, that hasn't been my experience, dear. Like she, when all those black women were coming out, showing the, the discrepancies and pays and opportunity for talented black women in Hollywood. And so they go to prominent black and they, it's like, well, that's that's them Negroes over there. So we've always had uh, black people who claim to be exempt from blackness, from the black experience or unique within the black experience. But we know, we who are conscious, is that often that, as I often say, people who claim to be immune or impervious to propaganda are often the primary victims of propaganda. The people who are like, yeah, they don't trick me. I'm woke. And then people who think they know shit are generally the people who don't really know shit. Because people who know shit, the first thing you do when you start to know shit is you get humbled by how little you know. But anyway, it's the same thing. So a lot of these black folks out here uh, who say they're exempt, we know they're all exempt, but many of these black people who are victims take an additional step. Where you at? You coming through? Do I have to add you? Good evening, bro. Hey, man. Like, what is this? I, hey, they say you ain't on your job. They say you ain't on your job. That's cold blooded, man. That's cold. I, I know you. I know you take care of business. I know you handle business, but everybody don't know you like I know you. To me. So I be on here making excuses for you. People that's, label like, well, crazy. Skip ain't here. With, well, Skip, you know, he got preoccupied. I come on here with a black eye. I say, oh, I just slipped and <laughs> fell. It didn't do nothing. I'm constantly making excuses for you and people starting to doubt. Even I can't cover for you. What that got to I'm sorry. But I was I was talking about victims and vectors. We'll get to that later. Well, let's just jump in with both feet. I know you eager. You missed us as much as we missed you, right? So let's jump in with both feet. First thing I want to talk about is I want to discuss one component 
of the Zionist genocide, right? And that the fact that Zionism basically, once again, exposed the myth of white privilege, hmm. right? So Zionism has once again exposed the myth of black white privilege because just recently uh, they bombed a convoy of aid workers, right? So mm -hmm. they shot and blew up one aid workers convoy, a van that had clear markings, right? Mm -hmm. And so the survivors of that bombing went to a second van. And then that second van was bombed. Hold and it. then they went, they sent a third van to that convoy to extract the workers. And the third van was bombed that had mostly injured people in it, right? But what's unique about this particular series of bombing is that these was white folks from Europe, blonde haired, blue eyed, whatever you wanted to find as white. These was good white folks who went there to, to give dispense food and charity to, to, to the uh, lowly Arabs in their time of need. And they bombed the shit out of these white people. And everyone, when that story first dropped, was talking about, oh, this is it. They've gone too far. <laughs> they don they bombed these, these white folks. And, and, and now it ain't just Arab men, women, and children. It ain't just Muslims. The Zionist state has murdered, callously murdered people who matter. Mm. And mm. what became of it? Did funding cease to the Zionist state? No. Were arms shipment to the Zionist state ceased? No. Was there a blockade put on the Zionist state? No. The aid organization said, hey, we're not sending any more aid convoys. And the aid that was coming there got rerouted and sent back. Mm -hmm. And the Zionists were like, uh, first they said, well, this aid convoy that has just dropped off several tons of food in Palestine, occupied territory of Palestine, because all of Israel is Palestine. So the fact that they got us calling literally two neighborhoods Palestine, that's like calling the reservations spotted across this country, Native America. All of this is Native America, but after they dropped that shit off and they said, well, we thought they were harboring a Hamas leader. They were harboring a Hamas leader. And then when that didn't work, they were like, uh, sorry, fucking oops. You know, it was just a miscommunication. It was a miscommunication. So I always have to remind black white folks, I be trying to talk to white people, right? And I tell white folks, don't let black people get you killed. Don't let white folks get you killed because white folks will come to you and say, hey, white folks, you have white privilege. So while we're out here protesting police brutality, while we're out here protesting Native people protesting the clear cutting of the Amazon. While we're protesting the genocide in Gaza, why don't you bring your white fleshy bodies and form a barrier? If you know during the George Floyd rebellion, they had white folks locking arms around black people. You had white folks going to Gaza to stand in front of homes that were scheduled to be demolished. You had white people going to Iraq and Afghanistan to be conscientious, to be observers. Right now, you got white folks on hunger strikes. You got white men who set itself ablaze. All this white solidarity. And what the fuck does it amount for? Do the other white people like, oh no, white folks are getting hurt. White folks are getting bombed. White folks are starving themselves and taken to the streets by hundreds of thousands. Where the fuck is the white privilege when it comes to trying to do anything humane or decent? Where is it? Where are those six white, pasty white aid workers? Where's their privilege now? 
So I argue that there is no white privilege. It is a myth. Like I said, if those white people who ran up in the White House on January 6th charged the White House for single payer health care, if they are, no, they're not poor white folks. I'm sorry. These are affluent white folks. When you look at the whole white saviors, the white folks who go around the world giving AIDS and go on missions and building schools and go around the world purifying water. These are from the upper echelon of white folks. These are middle class, college educated, passport wielding white folks. The redneck white folks, the poor white folks in the trailer parks, they're the ones sitting here saying they came to took her jobs. They make the white folks you see in the missions. Them ain't the Greenpeace white folks. Them ain't the PETA. When you see white folks standing in front of cattle cars, them ain't the poor white folks. The poor white folks are generally conservative. Poor white folks are xenophobic. These are the affluent white folks who speak many languages, who had a summer abroad. And I went abroad. I went to, to Venezuela. I went to Vietnam. And I got to see the beautiful, exotic people of the world. White folks who can stand a little bit more spice in their food. So I'm sorry, these are not the poor white folks. I like, because we want to believe that white privilege is a thing. So we got to come up with some rationalization. Because when I told black folks white privilege ain't real, they got mad at me. So just one lesson out of many lessons to be learned from this. The, 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 and I talk about the genocide of the moment. <laughs> there are multiple genocides happening all the time, all over. And this particular genocide is the genocide of the hour. Just like Darfur, just like Rwanda, Congo, and they'll pop up. Even they'll start talking about Native Americans and some researcher, some young white researcher will go on Native American reservation and look at life expectancy and look at liver disease and malnourishment. And some, some white go, guy will go down to the Maquiladoras in, 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 uh, on the US-Mexico border and see the hundreds of disappeared women and start talking about femicide. And so this is the genocide of the hour. And this genocide will fade and another genocide will, will, will emerge in the news cycle. And we're in a perpetual state of multiple genocides. And we only get to talk about one at a time. And then the genocide you care about, people, what about the Congo? What about Haiti? Just be patient. The news cycle will get back to you. Hmm. Now I don't mean to be horrible, but I am horrible. Yeah, I mean, you know, um, I think the thing that is most telling about the argument uh, <clears throat> is how it, it plays itself out, especially as you scale up, right? Like scaling down your local police force may be less likely to pull over this white girl driver right but but it doesn't stop it doesn't stop beyond that right like you just take it up a little further the national guard will you know well now of course the military will as you go other places uh the only acceptable answer is if it's in service to the status quo and right. uh, anything that is not in service to the status quo uh, can be disposed of to maintain uh, the status quo. Yeah. And, and, and black folks, we rather just believe it's strictly if we could be made white as uh, what's her name tells us. She yeah. tells us that if we can be made white and it's insanity that black people are talking about closing gaps between black folks and white folks. See, these are the white folks that got bombed by Israel. Australian, Polish. Look at that. You don't get more Aryan than that. British. What you talking about? These ain't poor white folks. These are skilled, internationally world-traveled people. Another Brit. Oh, those are their corpses being transported, their IDs. White boys, British. These are the aid workers. And you want to act like these ain't poor folks. And so it's like white privilege is a myth. It does not exist. This system 
has as much smoke for white people trying to do the right thing as it has for anybody else trying to do the right thing. In fact, I could argue in some uh, in some issues, in some struggles, at some times in history, the system will have more smoke for the white folks trying to do right than it does by non-white trying to do white. You ever heard the phrase, the only thing worse than an N-word is an N-word lover? You think white folks was playing when they said that? If you go read the history of lynching, they didn't figure out how to lynch, how to hunt down, capture, bind, mutilate, torture, murder, and display a corpse. They didn't learn that on Africans. Prior to the Emancipation Proclamation, the primary victims uh -oh. of lynching in the United States were white males. Check this out. I think this is an interesting. Uh, I think this is interesting. There are levels of some of social dominance, and just because one level can supersede another, doesn't mean the smother dominances don't exist. We're not denying dominance. We're denying definitions and rationalizations and explanations. Just because yeah, dominance I, I don't know exists if doesn't mean you comprehend the 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 how the dominance work yeah and i don't know if if this is um agreeing or disagreeing i think it's a really interesting uh piece of nuance that that we have because because i think i think where we keep trying to tease something out but i don't think we really like really nail it down that your individual ability to dominate me is only allowed if it reinforces the status quo. So you can be whiter than me if you're going to the bank and participating in capitalism on whatever level you can participate in it in. The moment that you pull away from that, all the trinkets and treats that you think your whatever deserves is then taken away and you're relegated to other. 100. It's like James said, 100. <clears throat> so, and I, I do think we need this clarity because this misunderstanding of white privilege as i gave examples to it 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 warps our methods it doesn't it doesn't just about our attitudes and misperception this fallacy of white privilege has greatly disrupted how we organize and how we approach to things all throughout the civil rights movement and up till now my wife was 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 working with some of her colleagues in her field and someone came to her and warned her about upsetting the white people who are on her side. That somehow winning mm -hmm. white people over to our cause and not upsetting the white people who have embraced our cause, not going too hard, too forceful, too direct, too fast, because we got white people on our side and we want to preserve those allies. All of that was born out of this fallacy of white privilege. The fact that we want white people on our side or that we need white people on our side. When I tell white people, if you want to serve any movement or cause or struggle, the best thing you can do is fix your problems. And white mm -hmm. people don't know that they're under the gun, that they're under the boot, mm -hmm. that they're also on the chopping block. Mm -hmm. So I, I think that we just, every opportunity we have to show that there is no such thing as white privilege it is white pathology when mm -hmm. you see white people getting away with shit because we see white people they don't white people you know can commit the exact same crime as a black person and receive less time mm -hmm. less harsh sentences right but mm -hmm. what they don't point out is the primary victims of white crimes are other white people mm -hmm. The primary victims of white crimes, whereas R. Kelly's doing 85 years in prison, Donald Trump 
who has had also has a long history of, of assault. Donald Trump is uh, the leading th candidate for president. And people are like, see, that's white privilege. R. Kelly locked up. Woo, woo. And we'll get, I'm, I'm jumping the gun a little bit. But what they fail to realize, all them women he's been assaulting and he's prating around the world. After assaulting and insulting, right now, the judge overseeing his uh, uh, corruption trial, he's out threatening and doxing the daughter of the judge. All white folks. And black people still talk about, oh, that's white privilege. And ignoring the fact that most of the people suffering from uh, the, the, the direct predations of white folks is other white folks. Europe, everybody, we, we, we focus too much on the dollar signs. Europe is the most, if, if you are to believe the research of Dr. Helen Caldecott, or if you don't like white folks, to believe the research of Dr. Vandana Shiva, Europe is the most nuclear contaminated soil on the earth is western europe france germany hmm. uk scotland the most radioactive place in the earth are these affluent countries mad cow disease rendering they say we're upwards to 60 to 75 percent of all western europeans were they don't even report on mad cow disease i'm not saying we got it good but the myth of white privilege distorts black people's comprehension of reality, our comprehension of what we should be fighting for, fighting for equality or trying to close the gap. We're trying to catch up to people who are headed off a fucking cliff. So I just want to use this as another example in my pocket to say white people are not privileged. White people are pathological. And white people who break from that patholo pathology White people who break from the systems and institutions of capitalism and global white hegemony, they move right to the top of the hit list of the of our oppressors. And we got way too much history to still be walking the face of the earth as African people talking about white privilege. I don't know where the fuck that shit came from, but it's got to go. It needs to leave our vocabulary. How much well, more evidence that do we need that it is pathology that brings them together? It is their pathology that allows them to 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 get uh, special consideration. If you want special consideration in this system as a white person, it's not enough to be white. You have to be white and pathological. If you are white and humane, white and honest, white and revolutionary white and progressive white and marxist then don't don't think don't come on don't and black folk don't get behind no white antifa and think oh yeah i'm gonna get behind this white boy this antifa white boy in during in the march and think he can shield you that 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 white cop or black cop now won't hesitate <clears throat> to shoot through him they shoot you and, saying. and I don't, I just, I just, again, want to be very clear in what I think. The idea that whiteness protects you from the empire is definitely false. And there are instances where whiteness gets you individual opportunities that being black or other will not get you and i think i think we have to i think the the general idea is something that i can really wrap my brain around and i recognize that being white is protected in ways that blackness isn't but it gets it gets there i think uh i forgot who who said yeah passionate rebellion i'm gonna put it up i think this is the point right uh it hyper fixates on individual interpersonal dynamics instead of focusing on dominant socio-political forces I think that is where whiteness shows up in ways that black people don't get access to it. Cause the thing is, um, 
a black person and a white person goes in for a job, a white person is hiring. The idea that I'm more comfortable with this person, I understand this person, we have similar experiences, shows up, right? I do think that when when you're talking about just those individual, we can pick and choose the outcome, what my preference is. Yeah, I think I think that's a thing. But I think this idea that whiteness can be radical and blackness can't is kind of not accounting for the fact that your daddy can afford to bail you out of jail. The fact that your, your mother knows or went to school with the police chief and there's a whole community of whiteness that operates in just that very individual sense. I think it really gets out. You get uh, you get over the top of your skis when when you try to move beyond that in in a global conversation. Because as you said, you know that should get you killed. You know, yeah. It's so, and and I just want to uh, say. Um, I don't think all white people are pathological. And someone said pathology in terms of disease. Mm -hmm. um, when, when you talk about pathology, it's different than like in medical sense, it's different than like an injury. So you can come in with a shattered femur and no one will say you have a pathology. And mm -hmm. when you talk about a pathological or a pathology, you're talking about a system or a process. Because you got a broken bone, you can have other related injuries. You know, but generally, if you have a pathology, it's more of a systemic issue. Even if you have the pathology is located or primarily located in one organ or one area of the of the organism, they understand it up ends it all. So pathology, yeah, you can use it, but I use it in a more sociological sense, more so than a a, a, a biomedical sense. But it understand that when you talk about path a pathologist looks at systems and interrelated and they don't even look at the disease. They also look at what causes the disease, what environmental or genetic factors. They also look at the prognosis, meaning what is the potential outcome, the survivability or, or the factors that will play into uh, uh, reversing. Or sometimes they say the disease is so progressed, you just want to try to hold it in its place as opposed to have it. Uh, uh, curing the person. But anyway, I don't think all white people are pathological, but I think the whole of Western culture, the white culture, the white economy, white social relationships are all pathological. I think so many years of being the dominant force has warped their culture that to where they themselves have suppressed the humane elements of their culture in order to maintain their hegemony. Like I always say, if you want to be, if you're a white person and you want to be erased from the history books, be a humane and just white person. But if you're a white person and you want to hold status amongst your people, if you want a monument, if you want to be on the face of the currency, if you want a statue or a holiday, then you've got to be a genocidal. If you want a scholar, Rhodes Scholar, you take out any currency of any European country. You, you name any holiday or you take me on a tour to any major city in any major European place. I was in Italy and I'm looking at the artwork and architecture there. And the Italians are like, yeah, Mussolini, this is all fascist. We all paraded and people come from all over the world to look at this fascist monument. So you show me any monuments in Western culture. But even though white folks, there are so many good white folks, uh, Smedley Butler. That's a boy. You know, there'll never be a holiday. He'll never show up on money. You don't even see. You see white boys. You go around white boys, and they got on Charles Manson t-shirts. And I'm pretty sure it's pretty soon Jeffrey Dahmer has a Netflix special that everybody's watching. And now they're auctioning off paintings of George W. Bush. And everybody wants a George W. Bush painting. While white folks who says, I'm going to humanize my people, I'm going to educate my people, Karl Marx, 
Karl Marx, they all hate Karl Marx. And they even got black folks hating Karl Marx. And black people don't even know why they hate Karl Marx. And you, like I said, Karl Marx, Marxist is the N-word for white people. I said, if you know a white person you don't like, if you really want to hurt a white folks feeling to the bone, if you want that white person to go home and twist and turn in the bed and, 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 and weep and cry himself to sleep, it doesn't matter what context or what the conflict is. Call him a Marxist. I don't care what. You can have a fender bender with a white person. If a white person ever says you are an N-word, say you're a Marxist. They hate that shit. And what the fuck did Marx do? What did he do? So I say all that. No, all white people aren't pathological, but the entirety of white culture, politics, economics, social relations and social hierarchies, systems of development, systems of extraction, production and distribution, all that shit is pathological. But yeah, there are also, some people in the past and present who have fought against it. Yeah. Um, I think another thing is as we're looking, I think about this a lot, and it comes up in a lot of my conversations, right? Um, English is a very young language. And there are terms in other language that allow for nuance. <laughs> English is pretty much um, and a lot of terms are defined by its opposite. Right? Um, and, and there is a thing that exists that we don't always know how to say. And I think sometimes we hold on to ideas and concepts and we try to make them mean a whole lot of different things. But as we learn more, we find more and more nuances present. Um, so I like I like the way Diallo, you know, um, a smart person I know um, calls it white eminence, right? And I think looking up the term uh, and, and coming across Natalie Collier's work on white eminence would be smart. Um, because there's this rush, like when Diallo talks about, you know, uh, you, you have to be involved in that pathology in order to be remembered. I think that types of, that thing shows up because it's really a rush to win anything, even if nobody else is competing. And, and I don't think we really understand what, what all of those things like result in right so uh i i know y'all know that that i love um my sons right and wednesdays i, I, is, I, I would I'm, I'm glad you reminded me because sometimes i yeah. forget <laughs> wednesdays <laughs> is typically soccer day right the little one has soccer from four to 5 30 and the oldest will have soccer from 6 to 7 30 right i bring this up because yesterday the little one who's eight they're both little okay the little <laughs> one at eight was playing a friendly against uh a team from an affluent white area there are two black kids on the team, so it's not like it's this, is this, this black thing and it's black and it's white. No, there there are two black kids on the team. They're buddies, my son and the other black kid, and and my son would be running, and and parents would yell things like, "Put a body on that kid." Why are we so emotionally invested, not in our son competing, but in our son winning? They eight years old playing. It don't even, it's not even, there isn't even a win at the end of this. It's a friendly, like at the end of it, you don't get a win or a loss. 
they're eight. And these white men and women at some tournaments are like yelling things like, and I'm trying to figure out like why you look like me. So I'm assuming you weren't a great athlete at any point in your life. Why are you so consumed with winning little kid soccer? Because isn't that supposed to teach them values for the future? That's what everybody time they say, because both of my sons are over six feet tall. And everybody wants my sons to, 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 to engage in one form of ball chasing or another. And when I'd be like, well, that's up to them. And they'd always talk about the life skills. Wasn't there some Uncle Tom that put out a viral video some years back and say, if you don't want your kids in jail, you don't want your kids to become uh, uh, um, gang bangers, you don't want your kids to drop out and, and succeed, then you need to have them chase balls. If you don't want the police to kill your sons, teach them to chase balls because chasing balls teaches them how they can be coached. And if they can be coached, they can obey. They can listen. And all the values that it takes to be a great ball chaser are the same values that it takes to achieve in society, especially as a black male. So that's why. And most ball fields are replica or, or, or some type of duplication of gladiatorial combat or a battlefield. Right. Taking and holding territory. And I ain't opposed. Violating. Did you ever read the ISIS papers? Listen, bro. Of course. Like, how you think we got here? What what I'm saying, you know, I was listening, I too listened to public enemy. Um, I I just they don't listen to themselves no more. Boy, I'm gonna sip tea on that. Hey, listen, boy, boy, when we, boy, listen to me, boy. They put his heroes I, on stamps. That's where they, that's how they got Chuck D. They put his hero on stamps. He couldn't do that song no more. Listen, man. I, I just find myself looking at this stuff and just being like, so one guy, and it wasn't even a black kid. Because again, the big one, is the only black kid on the team. We go tournaments where we don't see another black kid on the field. Right? Mm. This this white boy, hard play, knocks a kid down. This grown man says, what do you expect out of people from Jackson? Out of for white, this kid, Stay in 3,000 square feet. What? What? Well, you remember what your president said. He didn't want to integrate the schools because he didn't want his kids going to a jungle to get educated. And uh, you know how, and remember Al Gore and Tipper Gore, the former vice president and vice first lady said that, that black music and black culture was corrupting suburban America. So it's Listen, still your bro. fault. Your child on the team resonating uh, uh, gangsterism. <laughs> gangsterism by being eight and crying. Like, I just, I just, there is I something. Mean, there, there is, is studies something. that demonstrate that white kids learn racism before they learn to walk. So, and, and some black psychologists, researchers, neuropsychologists and neuroscientists found that white racism starts much earlier. Before they learn to stand up, they know how to identify white and black and they understand white is superior. So no point in in, in, in thugging in streets. Maybe the same holds for black kids in streets. Just saying. Tell your kids to stop. Tell your son to stop corrupting those good white kids. That's the point here. Because, bro, like, what? You want to be like, okay, I can't remember who I saw it with, but I know I saw it on Reddit because I don't do anything but Reddit, right? This lady was like, how we got billionaires and ain't none of them solving no problems? 
And we know the answer to that, right? Because there is no good billionaire. Well, that's not true. Uh, Elon, ex-wife, I guess, is the only good billionaire because she just, hey, boy, she put money in nonprofit streets. Shout out to her. Bill right? and Melinda Gates have given away more than her. Hey, not like she doing it. I'm talking about, boy, she just rolling up. Oh, man, this is a beautiful idea. Here go $2 million. And that's a pittance, right? That's a pittance. I have to tell you. Go ahead. There were revolutions fought because the peasants didn't want to live according to the whims of the benevolent monarchs. So I'm not going to be gracious or grateful to someone giving me a fraction back of what they've stolen. But that's just me. I don't know. Gratitude is not my attitude. That's just me. I don't know. I appreciate shit. Hey, man. Hey, listen. And, and as a person that that raises money for a nonprofit and gets paid by a nonprofit, shout out to her. Um, but I think I think this idea though that you will only be remembered by your cruelty is something that's just like man like i just whew, i just i just could not i just could not imagine going to bed waking up and knowing that there are problems that needed to be solved that only took money like there were problems that could be solved with money and i had so much money that i could solve that problem and I wouldn't, and how we keep. But no problems are solved by money. You can't really name any fundamental problem of the human condition that has been solved by money. Exactly. And while we're on that, let's move on to, to, to the topic of the evening, which is powerful blacks. So we've done enough giving uh, praises to powerful whites. Powerful blacks versus black power. Last week when I was doing the Bro Diallo show, the, the 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 feds had just raided three of Puffy's properties. I think one in Miami, one in in, in Don't California. Don't you out here talking about? I just well, there was a you know I never talk about the whole or nothing. I just find one aspect of what I was about to say something, but I ain't gonna say it. I'm not gonna say it. I tell you, boy, Thanks. I'm a better man. I'm growing. Because I was about to say something that I had no business saying. But so there are components of stories, even though the whole overall story might be just bullshit or just tabloid father. There was a component of the story that stood out to me. And it was the fact that I did not see the defenders. I didn't see people coming out, the conspiratorial people coming out. Oh, you know, Puffy was about to make this move and the man's trying to bring Puffy down and another successful black man being taken down by the system and, and framed by the system. I hadn't seen it. I didn't say it wasn't there. I said I hadn't seen it. And I was quite surprised because in all the other prominent black men who faced uh, investigation, prosecution, raids, trials, any black man that's that's eight figures or better and has a public persona, they all say, oh, you, and but I didn't see that for Puffy. And someone said it's because he's accused of also engaging in homosexual acts. So the brothers who generally come with that shit, the, 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 the black manosphere, which is the current name for them, even though they've been around a lot longer than that term. The guys out here saying Cosby, they trying to take down Cosby. And all that shit. People are like, oh, they went after Michael Jordan and saying the Illuminati killed Michael Jordan's father and all that shit. Right? Uh, I didn't see that for Puffy. And somebody said, oh, it's because he's accused of homosexual acts along with all the other behaviors. And that's why the manosphere, the black pill, the red pill, that whole cabal of successful, powerful black man is a, an affront to capitalism. Uh, that's why they abandoned him. And I kind of stood out because I remember when one of R. Kelly's victims, one of his male victims actually testified in the trial. 
and I'm here in Chicago in R. Kelly, you know, like just a, a year or two ago, I'd be, uh, my sons were taking music classes at the Merritt School of Music, which is downtown, mm. just off downtown. And R. Kelly was living in Trump Tower, which is a very appropriate place for him to reside, you know. Uh, and I would see he had one of those, you, you know what a slingshot is? Yeah. The, the car. Yeah. The three wheel, them fancy ass tricked out three wheels. Well, he first off, it's not fancy. It's a, uh, uh, it's a, it's a Saturn. It's fancy to me. Yeah, it's not, it's not fancy. Well, I'm, exactly not a, I'm not a rap star, man. I don't have things like that. I've never. So forgive me. I'm sorry. It's fancy to me. That <sighs> thing is a twenty thousand dollar tricycle, and that's not without features. What you mean it ain't fancy? Anyway, as I was saying, he had one of them tricked out slingshots custom paint everything and he'd be smoking these giant cigar wheeling that slingshot and i'd see him like oh god damn that's r kelly but anyway r kelly has a lot of people who support him here and then when his the like the day when they the news report came out that one of his male victims was testifying every all of his supporters went quiet <laughs> like oh he did some gay shit so they went quiet. So they're like, oh, my scumbaggery comes up against my, you know, most scumbags are also homophobic. You know, and most homophobic people are scumbags. So I'm a scumbag. So I support R. Kelly, but I'm a scumbag. So I'm also homophobic. So when your scumbaggery bumps up against your homophobia and they mesh together, I just feel sympathy for the scumbag who get all behind. Uh, but anyway. I was just saying shout out to the black community for not running that game and that bullshit for P. Diddy. But lo and behold, throughout as a week and a half has gone by, now the whole chorus and they coming for Diddy because he's a successful black man, taking down another black billionaire. B B Diddy was on the cusp. They're forcing him to sell his bad boy library. They're forcing him to sell and he had to sign over uh, revolt media to his white partner so that's another black media empire being taken down so it's here now another successful black man being taken down by the system and it breaks my fucking heart to see black people go through this shit every time when i'm just gonna say the word the r word the rt word or the t word traitor when a race traitor and we, as Dell Jones said, we lose so much we don't know what a victory looks like. So the fact that we look at a black billionaire as number one, being something to aspire to, number two, someone who is evidence of our development, our advancement as a people, and number three, as an ally in our larger struggle. So powerful blacks have more often than not been enemies of and distractions from black power they are not evidence powerful blacks are not evidence of black power i think that somebody may think that that's like a profound statement um and shout out to those people that think that but i i we just had this conversation about whiteness you cannot achieve the heights of whiteness without cruelty without oppression without domination right like you can't it don't exist without it right i can only name one black person that has reached a level of celebrity and stardom without white assistance and white without a white man pushing a button who that is? Lil Boosie. Jesus Christ, here you go with that shit again. Here Listen, you go. You This is like the fourth or fifth time you didn't come with that. Listen. 
Let me tell you something. Go on, tell me something. Lil Boosie can show up in places and white people won't have the slightest idea who he is. He's not unique and in I'm that. Go I'm talking off. about... Let me tell you something. Lil Boosie can get on live. Wow, cool right here. Lil Boosie can get on live and do something, and black people will be talking about it all over places. And white people won't have the slightest idea oh, of Lord. who he is. Lord, white folks don't know who Bootsy is. Okay. All right. The that slightest. Is false. Okay, let's see. Let's see something. This is what I like to do, right? You know, you ever, uh, let's see. Well, Dero. Huh? What'd you say? Boosie was on death row. Not records. So he snitched. Like. You can say whatever he did. What I'm telling you is Lil Boosie pull out a wad of money and, and where he getting it from other than poor black folks. It, see, Brother Chris, I know nothing of Lil Boosie's music. And I can openly admit I can openly admit that my being Southern mm -hmm. taints this When I tell you, you might be right. Go on. I'm telling you, the boy show up and it ain't. <clears throat> Look, and now people in here talking about like, that's what I'm saying. Like, aside from that, if, if somebody if somebody was to say to me the white folks is trying to bring down boosie i would legitimately be concerned here's my thing about any black man that's been brought down you know what i've been scanning through what's that little boosie's audiences and i have to say that 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 to my surprise most of his concert audiences and performances have been predominantly black. But and he's not thing. doing large places. Here's the thing, like, though. And that's let me finish my point before you say here's the thing. You do not get to puff his status without some white boy pushing a button. You don't get the Jay Z status without some white boy pushing a button. Uh huh. You don't. You don't get to be. You don't get to be Bill Cosby without some white boy pushing a button. You have to be. He ain't signed the Warner Brother Records, bro. Yeah. Show me what. Show me where he performed. Show me his licensing. Is Boosie signed to to, to Warner Brother Records? That is, he signed, to, he has a multi-label deal. Show me. With show Wait, me. All I'm saying is there are some white figures, like he's got Trill Entertainment, which is a subsidiary of Warner Brothers, which is a subsidiary of Empire. All I'm saying, there are some buttons with white fingers on them. And all I'm telling you is, show I know me. Because I mean, now you're getting into whole, you know, uh, uh, old John Henry territory. You're kind of building this brother up to be a folk hero. You went too far. Uh, the, uh, so your first you went thing too far. You, you was right, and now you didn't just went right off a cliff. I'm I'm not I'm not off a cliff. What I'm white telling you label, is white distributor. There are white fingers all over his shit. But okay, you, like you just said, went to I the said, audience. I, 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 I was agreeing with you. Because because what you want to do, off, Diallo, and I'm not gonna world. get into this. I'm not gonna get into this with you because what you want to do is argue to be right. And if you want to be right, I'll just tell you that you're right. But what I'm telling you is, you look at his audience, 
You're not seeing a whole bunch of white faces. You I not said that. I music. disagree Diallo, to I'm that. still talking. Diallo, I'm still talking. You're not going to find his music being licensed and put in a whole lot of white spaces. You're not going to find Boosie on a TV show. Boosie knows his audience, and he navigates that audience. Is glad a TV show? No. Show me Lil Boosie on David Letterman. Show me Lil Boosie on Jimmy Kimmel. I don't think that's the marker. I think that is, because what you like to do, and I'm not going to get into it, but what you like to do is pound the table in the area that you think is white for you. And what I'm telling you is, in the, in the real world, I stay. I am not single white soul touch anything with that boy. It ain't nothing there. He get on his line. He not, he not worried about what he's not worried about what any corporate sponsor got to say. And I don't think, I don't think he's right. I don't think he's right in a lot of the ridiculous things that he says. But what we're not going to do is act like somebody says Boosie can do that. Jesus. It's just this. It's just not not true, but okay. I mean, he he's he's I said he has a black audience and and when he goes places, he has a predominantly black I was giving you that. And then you said ain't no white fingers pushing no buttons for him. That just was just that that just went beyond so show me are. where it show up i'm not arguing to be right i okay. just want accuracy diallo and, that's and, not and, true and, and, diallo that's not true let's go okay. to the next point because it's not true and we know it's not true so let's go to the next thing and i agree that he has a white audience i mean a, bl a predominantly black audience but i think that to to the extent that that is uh something to to uh be commendable uh, I, I'm, I really don't know. That's never been my ultimate marker, but never showing up on Jimmy Kimmel and all that. I, 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 I don't know if that's, but if you think Boosie self-made. And whenever you turn into Diddy, Jay-Z, Bill Cosby, uh, who else they say that that their white folks tried to take down? OJ Simpson. Uh, now I will say surprisingly, Yvette Carnell beat the drum for him, but I never saw it really get outside of that. Uh, the boy they got the Weather Channel. Ronald R Roland Martin, or no, 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 no. The dude who got the weather. Oh, oh. Black folks didn't come out for him. They didn't? I don't remember seeing it. I saw it. Okay. It okay. Yeah. And he went and bought the most expensive house in America. Byron Allen. Yeah. Byron yeah. Allen. Yeah. But like, like all of those guys. That people say somebody coming after, you know, they only well, got to where they were because they needed to be the black face of white empire because it just made it look good. But they not there. Uh, what did uh, a buddy that wrote the spook? Uh, he wrote uh, Sam Greenlee. Yeah, Sam Greenlee. When they were in the when they were in the uh, in the room, and he said, uh, "I don't think they picked any of us uh, for our militancy." And I think, I think, ain't none of the black folks down the point are taking down militancy. I, I, I mean, somebody said, "How about Tyler Perry?" 
I mean, like, again, definitely built by black folk, but don't employ them, don't pay them union wages, don't, you know, random folks out of there for trying to have a union to get paid what they were supposed to get paid. So, like, what, what white folks trying to take him down? Well, whenever someone talks about a black person being taken down by the system, because, I mean, I wouldn't go so far as to say every black person only got there because of, you know, they, they serve a purpose of some nefarious grand white scheme. But when someone starts to argue that a black person is being unjustly targeted by the system, I have two questions. What threat did they pose and what did the system gain through through neutralization of the threat? Very good question. So when you, when you want to talk about especially prominent because nobody cares, there's a lot of black people taken down by the system every day. Juveniles, you know, people with no voice and no power and no resources who are unjustly taken down by the system and most people don't give a fuck. But when someone who is prominent and known is taken down by the system and you claim that it is for some nefarious reasons, I have two questions. What threat did they pose? And what gain did the system get from neutralizing of the threat? Now, some people might argue that, well, the system just doesn't want to see a successful black man. So they're sadistic. But if you look at it, most of the black people that the community claims the system is taken down. The vast majority of prominent black men that are taken down by the system were assets of the system. And you can point to where white people, the white investors, the white elites take a loss on this person's uh, downfall. And actually they have to, white people find themselves having to regroup after this person is taken down. Hmm. So it kind of well that part. let's look at Bill Cosby. Okay. Bill Cosby unto himself was an industry. Bill Cosby was called America's dad in all media outlets. Remember, Bill Cosby just wasn't the Cosby show. Mm -hmm. The production team and the model that he set out went on for decades. Cosby show, different world. Remember him and Felicia Rasad had another five season running successful uh Cosby show with Dougie Doug. CBS. Yes, after yep, that. CBS, yep. And going all the way back to Fat Albert. Um if you in in um Bill Cosby was such an asset. There's almost a half a chapter dedicated to Bill Cosby and his propaganda impacts written by George Jackson. And I spy at the very moment that, that the United States was implementing and perfecting its intelligence operations against the black militant struggle, at the very moment that the intelligence agencies were beginning to integrate and train black agents, you had one of the most prominent black men in the country pretend to be an agent going all over the world. That show I Spy was a mega hit. And it was the first time a black man prime time that was a partnered with a white man going off and, and, and doing spy shit. And at the same time, spies were destroying our black liberation struggle. Little black kids were coming home from school. their segregated schools watching a prominent black spy on TV. And he was funding scholarships. He was um, publishing. We forget about his books. He was a publishing powerhouse, a broadcast media powerhouse. His movies all sucked, but he was doing movie on Ghost Dad, all that weird shit. You ain't like Little Part Six? Uh, I couldn't get through it. I actually turned it off, and that was VHS when you didn't have options. It wasn't. This was. I was watching that shit. I had to turn that shit off, and we had rented that shit from the hood <laughs> movie rental. I got up and walked over to the VCR and pushed stop. <laughs> I didn't even rewind that shit. I paid the five cent rewind fee because I'm like, get this shit out of my house. But anyway, Bill Cosby was generating a lot of money for a lot of white folks. The residuals. The residuals hmm. from just the Cosby show alone. 
So what threat did Bill Cosby pose to any insidious white agenda against our community? What opposition did he present to any white power industry institution or agenda? I will argue that Bill Cosby was a primary asset of the systems and institutions of white Hmm. hegemony. Hmm. Bill Cosby was an asset to conservative ideology and conservative policymakers, to reactionary and and racist uh, uh, think tanks and institutes. And Bill Cosby was actually... His downfall was a win for the black community. I um I wrote down something that you said earlier. Um because I think you're arguing the point that I I guess I made poorly when I was like, you know, black folks are put into these positions when they're upholding whiteness. It's not being like Bill Cosby got summoned to a meeting with the Illuminati and was like, yo, can you please work for us? Um, And here's your, we just need your blood sacrifice and you can come on. But it's for all those things that you name, right? Like those shows, and I like them, right? Still do. Like it still name very funny episodes of, of, the Cosby show in a different world, the Dougie Doug show, not so much. Um, uh, that was a good show. And it was yeah, popular I mean, while it was out. It just didn't have the the, the impact. But I was old enough. To have to, yeah, but I was old enough to not have as much, right? Hmm. Um, But saying I let to say that, like, I just think I just think that any black celebrity that reaches that level has created a platform for whiteness to be in our community in the way that you're describing. Like, uh, so in the chat, I, I think this is, you know, in, was it blood in my eye? No, it wasn't blood in my eye. It's the second one. What's the so it was blood Soledad in my eye. brother? Solar Dad Soledad. brother. Solar Dad brother is where I think Solar Dad brother came out before Blood in My Eye. Okay, so I was right. It was the set. It, it was yeah. the first. In one fact, there. he was, wrote Blood in My Eye because he felt that Solar Dad brother misrepresented him and his yeah, right, boom views. So when he's talking about Bill Cosby, when Norman Lear talks about the Black Panther Party, talking about uh the reason he had to make good times, which was just real strange. Um, Stole it. But these shows are not to show us positive images of ourselves as much as they are to inform and, and confuse us into thinking that if we do something differently, the outcome in capitalism will be different for us. And I think any black person that reaches that level of success has to have a level of uh, complicity in 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 our continued expression oppression. That's like you don't just get accurate and clear statement, but unfortunately, yeah. the vast majority of our people. Uh, I would say militantly reject what you just said, which I think Mm. what you said should be common sense. But what you said is a profound and powerful statement. And I think that's unfortunate because what you just said should be the default position. What you just said should be our default position as a people. And we don't understand that we have, first of all, African people, We have never defined success. We've never defined what success was. I say all the time, and I don't think people understand the best way to become wealthy is to define wealth. 
it, once you define wealth, then you automatically become richer than whoever else doesn't hold to that definition. Mm. So when Europeans mm. came here, mm. they did not say to the native people, what are the symbols and statuses of wealth in your society and culture? And then go about working through the channels set up by Native Americans to achieve and overcome and outdo the Native Americans. They didn't do that when they went to China. They didn't do that when they went to Africa, when they went to India. They went to places that had longer standing markets and systems of value, systems of, 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 of development, had systems and hierarchies, more complex and intricate hierarchies than Europe had. And Europeans went to every corner of the world where the sun never set on their empire. And not once did they ever adopt their enemies' system of value, methods, and techniques for development and enrichment, or their definitions of success and value. Not once. So this sister, um, I wish I knew her name offhand. But she's so brilliant, so smart, doing some education work in Hawaii. Talks about that. She says that um, that white folks cannot tell her a point in time when everybody in their community was clothed, sheltered, and fed. And she can look at her history. She's a native Hawaiian. She can look at her history and say, up until this point, we were fine. And that point is when we came into contact with your people. And I think the idea that we have to define our own success, our own joy, our own freedom, and stick to that is one of those things that, like, it sounds so like pie in the sky but people don't understand how revolutionary it is because now you're taking a major distraction away like the the fact that we sit around and converse about whiteness and what whiteness thinks in the movies in the music um in just about any piece of art that's created like it reinforces this idea of the importance and it's a very bizarre thing for a person that doesn't do it so true and 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 for as long as um we are administering and i see it gets so frightening to me because i see people comparing individuals like Meek Mill and now they're saying Jay-Z is under the microscope and, and 50 cents was just accused by his uh, second baby mama of, 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 of SA and, and, and forcing himself upon her. And so now all these, and he's with that power and all that shit, uh, uh, glorification of the genocidal crack, uh, crack era. Um, saying where we're about to go through this whole era of seeing pillars i don't know what the fuck to call them people we look up to take a downfall and when when i started talking about um um what's that boy's name ice ice coon and it's weird to me because you know how i get down i will get more aggressive pushback and attack critiquing or disparaging someone like Ice Cube or even Obama than I would disparaging Jesus Christ and 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 the prophet Muhammad, you know. <laughs> man, every time that man come up, I just think about Gangstalicious and Boondocks, man. Who? I do like just, you remember uh, when Riley was talking to him and he was like, Ice Cube, the one that does those children's movies. Oh, I just like, like the fact no, that it's somebody the out one, there. Like when, when all in the, Ice Cube is just wild to me. 
Now, nah, when 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 um when the uh, Bill Clinton sat down with the Republican Congress and wrote down and 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 passed and signed the legislature the omnibus crime bill that more than doubled the black U.S. prison population, expanded the reach of the death penalty, and implemented for federal crimes mandatory minimums. N.W.A. New was Prince. playing in the background. N.W.A. wrote the soundtrack. No, well, I mean, the Democrats actually opposed. I mean, if you look at the 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 Clinton administration, you'll see uh, NAFTA, Kafka, the Omnibus Crime Bill. There was staunch Democratic opposition, and he had to build a Democratic Republican coalition. Just go look mm. at Maxine Waters' speeches during that time. Yeah, there were many times even Obama had to do this where he had to go and caucus with the Republican legislators because the Democratic uh, legislators would not give him, a, put him over. No, it was it was the Democratic uh, executive and the Republican legislature that actually hmm. were, were, were the main ones. Not that I'm trying to... Uh, no. I mean, up until the point where you had... when Remember when Bill Clinton signed the... Uh, what was that? Fucking... Where the welfare reform bill mm -hmm. and signed a document to send almost 2 million black kids into abject poverty and food insecurity. And white people were like, yeah, if, 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 if they stop giving blacks welfare, then that will increase my income. When the average white professional, the average white person who's sending their child off to college gets paid. The number one source of their income is government contracts, <laughs> you know, social workers, and all these motherfucking affluent white folks voting against their, you know. But anyway, white farmers voting against food stamps and other food subsidies. And then within less than a decade, you had a, a, a tenfold increase of white farmer suicide. Because <laughs> they know, you know, the welfare money doesn't. Yeah, we get welfare, but it don't stay in our pockets. Where does the welfare money end up? They looking mm -hmm. at where it go and they don't look at where it lands. But I digress. All well, I'm hello. saying. It go up. Like, Oh, I said all that to say is the gangster rappers of the 80s and early 90s were pied pipers of genocide. They were pied pipers of genocide. And and mm -hmm. I lived through the transition of hip hop being a, 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 a vehicle of conscious music to being a vehicle of uh, and, and a propaganda arm of the CIA. And I remember when they put out that FBI report when they made the song Fuck the Police and they were like, oh, this song is dangerous. When the two out of the three verses is literally MC Ren and and Easy e are mad at the police because police is thwarting their ability to kill black people. That's that's the MC Ren. And I, I and, and and Easy E in their verses are like I'm trying to kill black people and the police are getting in my way and chasing me down and preventing me and making it more difficult for me to kill black people. Stupid ass nigga with the, when I'm playing with the trigger because I blast the police. Why do the police after you? The police are after me because I'll blast on a stupid ass nigga when I'm playing with the trigger of an Uzi R and AK. Ice Cube is the only one that talks about racism in his verse. They have the authority to kill a minority. But, you know, they don't want me riding around in the bins. So I could give a pass to Ice Cube's verse. But now we find out he wrote all the fucking lyrics. So he just, and it's even more despicable that he saved the, the best verses for himself. So I digress. And, yeah. uh... I think, I think, I think I agree. I think I would have tried to make the point differently, even though I think I largely agree with it. I do think that here is a distinction that, that makes a, that makes a difference. I think all of that music at that time, and even now to a point, um, I think it's a little different now because I just 
I don't really understand all of the music that's being made right now. Um, but I think I think so many things happened, and one of the sneaky things that Bill Clinton doesn't get enough hate for is the Telecommunications Act. Um, he don't get enough hate. Period. Um, but I just think about the way that like De La Soul was able to exist and NWA was able to coexist at a time. But I also I'm not old I'm I'm not old enough to remember rapper's delight. I can only look at the lyrics and it's like I got a color TV so I can see the Knicks play basketball. Um, and I just think, I just think a lot of that stuff. The coexistence wasn't there. Yeah. The coexistence wasn't there. De La Soul didn't coexist with NWA. K, uh, De La Soul was suppressed. I remember when De La Soul, that's why their second album was De La Soul is Dead. And you remember they had their images on their first album and all their subsequent albums, they didn't have their faces on it. The second album of De La Soul was De La Soul was Dead. You know why they, they said De La Soul was dead? Because their, their original album was a classic. It was well received. And just as they were rocketing to deserved stardom, that's when this whole rah rah rugger shit came out. And if you listen to the skits where they were like, De La Soul is soft. And I mean, the, just so they didn't coexist. Even De La Soul, even De La Soul acknowledged that, hey, we, 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 we not thriving here. And um, they often mocked the whole gangster. If you listen to their, their, their skits on their album, where they talk about this hard rah rah environment when when there was a lot of conscious hip-hop back then it helped to sustain me through that era but that shit was aggressively suppressed i remember x clan all that was there but it wasn't a coexistence it was an overshadowing and suppression of conscious music okay you even ar arrested development was around then and remember ice cube but but He's like but listen about, what you, but listen uh, to what you keep saying. Say, but hold, uh -huh. hold on, Diallo. You named three groups that existed at the same time as NWA mm -hmm. that had records. Yep. And let me tell you this: like we can't even name you. those groups now. Like I'm talking I about. Like, them, but but here's no, the no, thing, you, though. No, here's no, the you thing. don't understand my point. Listen, you don't understand my point. Who are the contemporaries of today's music? that is doing the same thing those things that were in the vein of de la soul of x clan of poor righteous teachers of like like the average person can't even name an alternative to future drake and and whoever the other person is at this point i'm not gonna speak on today you know yeah. i can go get one of my sons to 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 hip you to that and and I don't even think it's it's my place to speak on this this era or your era. I I can learn, I can be instructed, but I can speak with with clarity and, and confidence about my era. Mm -hmm. And my era was a, a a a one of the most vicious and relentless propaganda campaign. And one thing I know, even when I first moved here to Chicago, in the drill era. And artists would promote their albums by saying, when my album dropped, the murder rate's going to go up. That was a marketing line. So most of these murder rappers today are nothing more than the bastard offspring. They are feeding off of the corpse that was slain by N.W.A. and Too Short. Done by the forces of nature, by, by Jungle Brothers, is one of the most phenomenal sonic experiences. But the thing is, when you look at the tours back then, when you look at NWA, 
versus uh public enemy de la soul pm don arrested development the translator crew all those they weren't coming over they were in the major cities and the major markets poor righteous teachers when i was a kid never came to fucking kansas city but nwa did when i want if i wanted to see even common sense before he lost sense his sense i had to go to these little college towns i remember you know it was the 2000s when i brought dead press to kansas city for the first time would you go to any backwater black area and the murder music saturated and you had to go to coffee shops and boutique lounges and 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 to indie theaters and 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 uh college towns to hear the progressive music even though it was a million and one times better than 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 the shit that was on the mainstream anyway i think we're a little off that we can kind of come back to black people and our solidarity for these prominent successful I'm, I'm saying black men because they those are the ones that come to mind but there are women like oprah winfrey who's that uh uh tv one lady um what was the tv i can't even we did a whole synopsis of her i can't even remember her name but anyway it, it it is regretful that we see that these people are aspirational they're not as they shouldn't be aspirational but they are and that they are assets or allies of the black community puff daddy and and any other kathy hughes thank you uh any of these prominent black people our leaders are their servants so we need to be more discern discerning not just in who we support but who we hold solidarity with in the downfall. I say we, we incentivize selling us out. We incentivize selling our own people out because we show just as much love and solidarity. Black folks in Philly showed up as much, if not more, in the streets to free Meek Mill as they did uh, Mumia. Mill got more love than Mumia in the last 10 years in terms of the criminal justice system in Philly. And I know some of y'all kind hearted. See, I was about to say something. I, I caught myself again. Oh, man, you just don't know. It's my halo. You see a halo because I'm doing good. Many of our people. Your brain. Oh, really? Like, oh. Randy. I'm... Huh? You break it up. This is amazing. Yeah. So many of our people are kind hearted saying, well, if a black man is taken down or if a black man is victimized by the system, it don't matter who they are, or what they did or didn't do. The system on principle. So we should stand and we should be together no matter who it is. And I have one thing to say to that. If your solidarity comes without any terms and conditions, your solidarity is absolutely fucking worthless. And what is the incentive? It's like, listen, I can sell out my people as a collective or I can find talented black people and, and thwart them and, and, and exploit them. It doesn't matter what I do. But if I secure the bag and I elevate in the system and I run afoul of the system through no fault of my own or through a, a long history of a corruption, the community going to uh, 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 stand with me, going to stand with me call out for me and support me then why would you not sell out why would you not go for self i also think it reinforces my belief that as soon as you show your allegiance to capital and capital finds you to be of a of a of a particular ilk like we gonna we gonna we gonna we gonna push that button and gonna you know boost you to the front because you're going to represent all those things that we need to be represented to your community like that's it yeah so like i i definitely i do think we should 
I love your uh you want you want to get rid of the first blacks. Like I love that. But I want to start advocating for keep. Right? Like, you know, free whoever. I don't know about that. Maybe we have to keep him. Like, I don't want I don't want them. I don't want them out here keep doing what they do in the eye folk. You know what I'm saying? Keep so don't Kanye. free Diddy. Keep Diddy. Keep Diddy. Keep Kanye. Keep Candace. Keep Barack and Michelle. Keep them. Like, nah, right? I'm straight. Keep them. I, and I just don't think that. I think pro blackness is obsolete. Well, this is what I will say. I don't disagree with the idea and the concept, but I think again, there's that piece of nuance, right? Mm -hmm. To be it's necessary, it is not mission. Like again, this Owens is black, and she'll tell you that she black. So we have to get beyond just the skin part and start getting to the politics part. And I think you do a really good job of talking about um, class solidarity. And I think we really have to be like, hey, man, like these folks do not represent our particular interests. So like, no, nah, I'm straight. Even more so than interests, I think it's clear to say powerful blacks are not evidence of black power yeah but i think i think i think it is easy to talk about black power and black excellence because because you don't have any real political grounding right like if you read black power by kwame Ture and charles hamilton right like if you read that book there is no way you arrive at ice cube got power like you know what i'm saying like but i think but he, go ahead i'm just saying he does have power that big three league he's reviving people's careers he's 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 made you know laid the foundation for the emergence of people like chris tucker and 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 who's that guy uh cat williams he has power but we don't understand that that power is not inherently good or bad so just saying power is not enough like okay. where does the power come from and how is the power utilized right. and and the thing is the problem okay. is as a people who are bombarded with negative self imagery our racial esteem our racial esteem as a people is extremely low right is extremely no, low and we're very very susceptible co collectively to and th and then this just whole call for representation and inclusion and equity so we have to understand that powerful blacks powerful blacks are not worthy of our support just by nature of being powerful and the components of powerful and most powerful blacks are in opposition to and enemies of black power. And until we figure out that powerful blacks are hostile and enemies of black power and not evidence of black power, we're going to be losing generations of very talented people who are chasing after a position and chasing after uh, rewards that lead us towards oblivion mm -hmm. because powerful blacks are individualistic. Black power is collective. Right. Powerful blacks are about accumulation, enriching themselves. Black power is about redistribution mm -hmm. and, and, and dispersing. Powerful blacks are about joining and reinforcing the status quo. Black power is about upending the status quo. And I think every black person of power and status as defined by the systems and institutions of white domination and capitalism should be, if not openly rejected, held with a great level of suspicion and hostility. And until we get there, our revolution won't even get fucking started, let alone be successfully executed. 
It's that serious. I think your power isn't good or bad. Like caught me in a in a lack, right? You know, caught me lacking, as the youth would say, because I'm looking at it like if you're not if you're not building us, if you're not, you know, contributing to us, if you're not focused on our collective condition, um, if you're not being explicit in the support, you will eventually find yourself, you know, working with the capitalists, you know, um, well, working with or for the capitalists. And I think that's where, that's where that was for me. But yeah. Let's get the let's get these folks in here, man. I'll go with the start comments and then we can share the link. Okay. All right. Uh, well, every put the link I in the chat it. first. That's what I'm looking for. The... You every single time it's like the first time I'm doing it. Okay. <laughs> I, I, and I can oh, yeah. uh I can start yeah. showing the the uh the, the first. All right. Uh I'm gonna skip one first. Okay. Uh and then I'm gonna go to this one. I thought this was hilarious. I'd like Boy. to, where is that mental sphere? I'd like to join it. Yeah, I just, hey man, I I don't know. I, I think we got there. another one right here though. Uh that we that that just popped up that I think like puts a bow on this. Yes, absolutely. Bars. Joe Cool. Right on, Joe Bars. Cool. Um, crispy and clean and clear. I agree yeah so the the link is in the chat i've shared the the link if you want to come live i agree i think that there should be class hostility and here's yep. the thing though wealthy black people show open content to poor and working class masses man in their music i mean in the way they spend their money i mean we at the height of the whole uh blood diamond struggle and they were talking about the congo being raped of blood diamonds and dudes was like oh this is the diamond age and encrusting their teeth with diamonds and their neck with diamonds and and it, it's it's just the the level of obscenity and disrespect young thug was asked about uh black struggle and uprising and he said we over here making money and 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 and, and, and got hoes and bitches let the politicians deal with that and the moment the system came down on him i saw people like free thug and they railroading thug I mean, we we don't make any demands of the people we lift up on our shoulders. Hey, listen, and I think that's a byproduct of low racial esteem. I oh, think that's, that's not the one I want. Absolutely untrue. You snatched that yeah, down. Hold on, too that's bad. not the one I wanted. That's not the one I wanted. That's a goddamn lie. Okay, I guess I guess that was the one I wanted. This right here, listen, bro, uh, human. I'm sorry. Um, listen here, human. Um, Buana. Buana, I don't know. I, I guess I guess that's how I say it, Buana. Um I think one rape is too many. <laughs> wow, you're so hard on us, man. God. <laughs> I think I think no if you rape, rape huh? <laughs> I think if you rape one person. It's like, whoa, what's going on? You know what I'm saying? It's but the same. You got to say it. When Bill Cosby get them get them rapes in, boy, boy. Um, so I just, I just, you know, I don't know. Like, if when people be like, well, what if your mama was was sent to jail for raping? Well, if my mama was out here raping, she does not need to be walking around. I just tend to draw the line at rape. I mean, I don't know. Like, you know. But I here's the thing. Just, Let's say, I would say this. I'm going to go a little further than you. Even if Cosby is 100% innocent, of the rape accusations i'm still mm. glad if he's being framed railroaded and set up i am happy and thankful i don't think that he's innocent i think that he did it but if i knew he was innocent and i had evidence to fully exonerate him i'd burn it i'd bury it or i'd try to sell it to him for 
at least 20 mil but 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 he he got his own daughter locked up for blackmail so i wouldn't even fucking go there mm -hmm. i'd burn it and let me tell you why long before the accusations went public he had already betrayed the black community bill cosby is a is an unapologetic and prolific race trader bill cosby went on a nationwide tour basically saying that black people are responsible for the condition of black people through our own laziness and immorality and that the white society gave black people all the resources time and support that we needed to elevate ourselves and we defied and openly rejected all of the opportunities Bill Cosby sat on the stage at like Carnegie Hall in a nice tailored suit and said, we black people didn't keep up our end of the bargain. White people gave us everything they promised us and they negotiated in good faith. And for a man of that prominence to tell that fucking lie on his own people, when you had a propaganda show showing black people in the most highest status, most beautiful portrayal of black people. And at the very time, this motherfucker was a propagandist of the highest order. When he was I spy and breaking history and breaking color barriers, the, the very agency, the CIA that he was giving positive propaganda to was implementing and executing the COINTELPRO program and using black infiltrators and black spies to do it. And then he came back from the 60s. He came to the fucking 80s with the Cosby show. And at the same time showing affluent, articulate, happy black people, the crack academic was being laid out and executed. The mass incarceration genocide was being, that motherfucker been providing cover for white genocide since he was first stepped on the stage so when a motherfucker like that goes out and we as a community couldn't see that as a win for our community our all this goddamn consciousness all this uh uh uh, uh black awareness where the fuck is the point of it if we don't even recognize a win when it's given to us so whatever white feminist took down bill cosby let me take you to coffee let me take you out to get a oat milk latte Thank you. Hey, Fuck bro. Bill Cosby. Hey, bro. Bill Cosby was so out of control that Nikki Giovanni was like, yo, this nigga tripping. <laughs> but he wasn't, though. He was very clear. He was very clear on what his mission was. Bro, with Nikki he was Giovanni. Well compensated for his services. That man was worth bro. over 800 million. And what Bro, harm could he have done if he wasn't exposed? What harm? This motherfucker basically said every black man in prison deserves to be there and should be there longer. A black child was shot Amen. in the back. And he said if the child wouldn't get shot, he shouldn't have stole the pound cake. If Bill his Cosby, mama didn't, if his mama didn't have him in Georgia. formed a rap group. Bill Cosby formed a rap group. Caused the Cosnerati, the Cosby Illuminati, to spread his anti black message. And y'all just let that shit happen. And every time I tell people about Bill Cosby, he put out a whole fucking album called The State of Emergency. He put out an album called The State of Emergency. talking about all this how bad black people are and if black people would just pull our pants up and learn to conjugate verbs properly stop dropping the g he said he went to an inner city grocery store lying motherfucker black people were he said he went to an inner city grocery store and he saw black children in their mother face mother's faces calling you in motherfucking bitch he said he saw black kids in poor black communities in the 90s saying calling they mothers bitches and motherfuckers i mean you just telling lies that you ain't even got to tell you telling lies i mean fuck bill cosby and it, it it sickens me i hate going on these cosby rapes if we should have had a parade the day cosby was a, a and i'm like yeah that is a rapist any man that could fucking disrespect his own people and cosby was there for the struggle 
Cosby was there. And remember at the height of the civil rights movement, go buy this album and burn it. This shitty but ass album. Don't buy it, but like, you know what I'm saying? Illegally download it and then talk about how terrible it is. All so you Cosby it. supporters. Yes. I should play um, one of the songs so off. That's the shittiest album, the Cosnerati. But yeah. I just, I like, yeah. I'm just saying. Don't but do I can make the same case against every other prominent Negro, every other prominent leading black that has our love and solidarity. We get mad when the white man took down somebody we should have taken down a generation before the white man ever got to him. We should have been gotten rid of uh, uh, Kanye before the white folks ever figured out. So, uh, so Joe Cool, uh, Nikki Giovanni was in Jackson, Mississippi, uh, at Jackson State University, D.I. Love, a uh, great school in the world, uh, and was talking about essentially what Diallo was talking about. Uh, with a lot less um, whatever. But one of the things that she said was that, you know, he was out of his mind uh, and alluded to the murder of his son and talking about how hurt he was, but still acknowledging that uh, that what he was saying was disrespectful to black people. What makes that so wild uh, to me uh, is, you know, my 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 OG uh, in this black stuff uh, refer to Nick Avani and a lot of those folks as a radical integrationist. And you know, the fact that these radical integrationists was like, "Hey, this nigga tripping," and he didn't went too far. Uh, shows how far off the reservation Bill Cosby had got, um, and and I think Diallo said said so much of it at, Man, at a very I've been high hating level. Bill Cosby since 1993. I've been hating on Bill Cosby. I've been hating on the goddamn different world. I hate that y'all let the different world get revived. When the whole message of that show is, if you conduct yourself properly, you can earn enough status and money to leave the black community. And I remember Dwayne Wayne looking at Sinbad saying, you know, this here uh, uh, student center. Like, and I had not seen anywhere else on the fucking media where people's ultimate goals and open, ultimate evidence of their success is getting as far away from the other people who look like them as possible. Listen, Bill Cosby was a hex and a scourge. And the only thing I regret about Bill Cosby is black people didn't kick him to the curb before white folks got a chance to. For our own respect and dignity. Dale Jones said, if somebody hates you, hate them back. If somebody hates you, hate them back. That's healthy. It is unhealthy and 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 and, and ir irrational to show love to somebody that hates you. So, oh, and, and as we, because we ain't getting no calls tonight. Don't nobody want to touch this subject. Yeah, well, somebody came out, but then they left. Because they didn't so connect. You know, there's your boy. There's you your self-made boy. I just went to the no, site. I was going uh, another one. I oh, I think that's a good and valid question. But y'all yeah. running out of time. Should I take this down so we can continue our discussion? Yeah, go ahead. Do your thing. Uh, -huh, because he has a, okay. The self-made black man. Okay. All right. Uh, I'm glad he takes that position. Actually, I'm so happy that uh, uh, Boosie don't want to be a slumlord. But um, black success in pa Pan-Africanism, success is defined as thwarting, subverting, and reversing the agendas of white hegemony. You are successful if you can identify an agenda, a priority, a project, of the systems and institutions of oppression and col col colonialism, and you are in a position to up in, thwart, and reverse it. Those are the only successful black people that we should define as successful or aspirational. That's it. And only until African land and people are liberated and African wealth, as we talk about success, is a restoration and preservation of ecosystems. That is wealth, clean air, fertile soil, non-contaminated, pollution-free water, bio-expanding, 
biodiversity, that as well. So if you define success and wealth from a pan-African perspective and you want to achieve that, you can only achieve that through being an anti-capitalist revolutionary. Those are the only successful black people who lived a life worthy of the sacrifices of our ancestors and live a life worthy of the praise of our uh, uh, descendants. Any other black person who cannot identify how their actions and deeds and aspirations do not fit into those two boxes cannot be defined as successful. Now, white people can praise them. White people can be involved in them. But we should be, if not openly hostile to black people who don't fit into that, we should at least be indifference. And when a black person has status and wealth in this system, we should start off with indifference. And work our way to hostility and opposition if they prove to go deeper. But if not, they should have to earn our praise. And I tell you something, if white folks love them, I don't trust them. Who's this white boy? Is this even Cuddly Mike? Cuddly Mike getting a Grammy? You know, we should be, white folks tell us who we should distrust. White folks put the Negroes we should be questioning and in distrustful are they put them on the Super Bowl stage. They put them up on the highest podiums and platform and give them money and trophies. They showing us the traitors and we praising the traitors. How easy can it get? The fuck? So, okay, I'm sorry. That is success. According to revolutionary Pan-Africanism. There's some other parts to it, but those are the main elements. Thank you, Namdi, for the continuing and ongoing support. Um, nobody wanted to come through and holler at us, man. I don't know what you did to turn people off tonight. It wasn't me, bro. It, it oh. sure ain't me. So look, everybody love me. Er everybody love me. Hey, listen. Uh, I do have an announcement that I want to make. Okay. All right. So, um, my job has a blog and I, I would up right and I would love some of you smart people um that write things uh and think things and think about writing things to definitely check out uh black girl times it's a blog from the lighthouse black girl project we are recruiting new writers and I would love for some of y'all that's over here to come write for us. So, you know. All right. You're not going to give us the link? Of the... I can't put a link in the chat. Why? For? It won't let me. Okay. Well, where can they find you? Because you you on Reddit with the white boys. Oh, it let me. Oh, I got oh, to do it. Go. Your name. There it go. There you go. There That's my more. email. Right. Email under my name. I didn't put hey. that in there. I don't. Know. That's that's what that's I be that. doing. I guess we get to wrap it up, man. Nobody want to come through and holler at us tonight. I don't know what you did to offend people. I always tell you to try to speak. You know what you say is very good, but you should speak it in a more humane and sensitive way. And so we didn't get nobody to come through. But uh, I appreciate you, bro. Glad you're here. Hey, man, I'm happy to be you back. All the doubters you. to bed. And I'll catch y'all uh, third Wednesday, every first and third Wednesday. Yep. Like, share, subscribe, share with your homies, your enemies, allies, lovers, and haters. Get the word out about the Rational Radical Show every first and third. No, it's too oh, late. Hold on, we got somebody. Roman, got is Roman coming Roman. on? Oh, uh, look how people do. You want to you wanna hang out for the, You want to wait around for these? Yeah, I got them, yeah. You know, like anybody want to come on? We on we on BP time, not CP time. Okay, Roman, welcome to. Hey, y'all, uh, hear me? Your name, where you calling from, and questions, comment, and criticism. My name. So, what's up? Uh, I'm calling from Austin, and I want to ask this question. Uh, I guess Skip, since you're here, um, Diallo has talked about how menticide is a very big problem. Uh, affecting our community and people, you know, the undermining of our beliefs and everything. And what y'all just talked about with celebrities, you know, in this worship of these people who are clearly don't have our interest in mind. I'm curious how you think we 
could turn this energy around and say we know our we should know our like say we should know our politicians as much as our celebrities how do we how do we start by moving that energy if that makes sense yeah um <clears throat> I think the 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 thing that jumps out at me is I think those of us that have a connection to um those of us that have a to the the something that we think we want to right you might turn it off a bit um, being capitalist right okay not being capitalist right but like really engaging in community i think one of the things that we could do a much better job of is connecting the ways that our activities reinforce those things that we say we don't believe in right um so i think one of the things a very a very like simple way of saying that i think a simple way of saying it is how do we engage those people in our community that we want to see do things differently because i think i think more times than not we find ourselves berating those people arguing with those people belittling those people and not really seeking to understand and teach those folks and trusting that we can't do it for them, but we can try to present the information in a different way and be present and be in community enough that gives folks an opportunity to ask questions and kind of walk along with someone on that journey because it's a long journey to get to, to where we want them to be. Like assuming, assuming Diallo is a nine, there's somebody else that looks at Diallo as a five, and I would like to think of myself as a two or a three, right? In attractiveness, like, I'll give you a higher number than that, man. <laughs> I'm gonna let that part lost me a little bit. I don't, I don't know what you mean by nines, twos. Okay, all right, yeah. So Diallo is a nut, right? Like he's a raving lunatic, right? <laughs> yeah, of course. <laughs> and and if we want to get people to to being raving lunatics well they just not gonna start at a nine right now right. to some people i am a raving lunatic so there has to be a step before me so if we're, we're we're looking at the number line trying to move people along we just have to be really firm in our spot so that when people get to us we can get them to the next spot as long as they want to go that way like i I can't do anything differently but i can try to be more patient and understanding with somebody that is just starting on their journey to get to wherever it is that we would like to see them go so see, that's what I, i'm saying I, i'm like dale jones said i'm tired of the remedial work <laughs> yeah see? so see diallo is tired of the remedial work and i said dale jones said that okay <laughs> but that's diallo right so I am. This is persona. I am doing work. You, I'm doing the work. And if you want somebody to be more advanced, then you got to connect them so that they can keep moving along the line to get more and more radical so they, so they can reach the place that you would like to see them go. Yeah. I would just like to define celebrity. Okay. Because okay. I agree with everything you said in response to his uh comments about menticide and waking our people up but we have to understand celebrity because i have a great appreciation and an unpayable debt to artists artists and artistry is an essential as essential to revolution as scholarship and weapons and you cannot find any revolutionary struggle any revolutionary movement or any revolutionary uprising that did not have a revolutionary <laughs> arts component so when i say and also artists can be scholars philosophers thinkers builders 
Being an artist or having artistic skill does not preclude or prevent you from developing and cultivating and mastering other skills. So I am not attacking artists. I'm not one to say an artist shouldn't be speaking or an artist shouldn't be leader. I'm fine with an artist. I don't care what their artistry is. Music, comedians, rising to a level of leadership. But the difference between an artist and a celebrity is that a celebrity is not about, it's got nothing to do with their talents. We all can name five celebrities that don't really do shit, but be famous. I just, if you can think of the first name of the Kardashian system, that's your five right there. A celebrity is a person who is a living embodiment of the aspirations of the system and culture they live within. Floyd Mayweather is a celebrity. He was a boxer, but long after he's boxing, he's popping up everywhere because of the money he flaunts and the, how he represents mass accumulation and, and frivolous spending of, of, of obscene amounts of money. So we should reject all celebrities and we should support artists and artistry. We should support value artists and artistry. Artists are people who can represent the values and the aspirations of the people. Celebrities represents the values and aspirations of the elites. Mm -hmm. So mm. it doesn't matter if you're the greatest athlete from Muhammad Ali and them, and they'll snatch your belt away. And you could be the greatest boxer. You could be a great rapper and they'll shelve you. You know, you could be the greatest performer, stage actor, or movie screen actor, and they won't cast you. But you could be mediocre as fuck. And sometimes celebrity and talent do come together, Cat Williams, and, and the person who is also talented and a celebrity, but they ain't shit. So I think we need to make an independent effort to support our artist instead of their celebrity. So go download Skip's album. SoundCloud, where you at, Skip? All over the place, man. <laughs> like Paul Robeson, yes. And you a strong six. So, Ask your wife, was... man. <laughs> Ask so, your wife. Don't be so down. You're a solid six. <laughs> well, thank y'all for <laughs> answering. Your babe, right? And, and if you get your <laughs> touch up, you get all the way up to seven or eight. Skip's a 10, bro. Leave him alone. Leave him alone, Joe. He a 10. <laughs> Oh, yeah, look at you blush. Oh, don't have Skip on here blushing. Look at your cheeks. Oh, <laughs> we love okay, you, Skip. Thank you. We'll leave on that yeah, note. Thank you, brother. Yeah, y'all have a great day. Thank y'all for doing right. the show as always. It was All a great right. talk. All right. Okay, Q, we're going to see. Q, we can't. Q, you're not coming through because it says that your device isn't connected. So I can't even bring Q on. So, Denzel. This, y'all. Peace. Can y'all hear me? Yes, yep. loud and clear. Question. Are you Denzel or Denzel? Where Denzel, I, I don't. Okay. I, yeah, I really hate how Denzel Washington like messed that up for us. It is Denzel. <laughs> okay. <laughs> you know. Um. So first, uh, actually, um, I'll say I have two uh unrelated questions. One, um, I want to, Diallo. I'm curious about your assessment or predictions for this new Senegalese president. Um, I've been hearing some talks about, you know, hey, we got a we got a leftist pan Africanist president um, in in Senegal. Um, there is hope, you know, but I'm curious about your assessment um, based on just what we see so far. Uh, he's got two wives, <laughs> so Senegal has two first ladies. So I mean, what I mean, like, it's, I'm glad that African values and cultures are being unapologetically rep, uh, represented. But this is all I was going to say. People know my people know my. I'm cautiously optimistic. We have had African leaders with militant rhetoric and make militant promises. But I say, you know, we got to be Janet Jackson with our shit. What have you done for us lately? So I'm cautiously optimistic. I'm glad that he has anti-colonial rhetoric. I'm glad that he has solid. African values and he's articulating African positions, pro-African, uh, anti-colonial positions, but that's not governance. So he, mm. I will, I would be cautiously optimistic. I will articulate support of the Senegalese people in their decision. 
I do think that he was truly democratically elected, which most African leaders can't even make that claim. So that gives me some some uh, uh, um, some optimism. But I don't think we claim anything that can't be defined. I think rhetoric is not enough. We've had too many leaders come out and say from Jomo Kenyatta to Mobutu Sese Seiko, they come out in African guard with anti-colonial rhetoric. And then soon as they remember, we got the back room, the boardroom and the billboard. So they got all this African rhetoric on the billboard and they got some superficial policies at the board table. But then when they go to the back room, they still selling us out. And I would like to see Senegal and the Gambia merge. I don't know why those are two separate countries. I mean, if, <laughs> if, if we could do away with that colonial border, maybe. So Gambians, I know y'all Gambians get mad at me when I say this. That is not two separate countries. That is weirdo. It's a weird little country that the white folks made for their own convenience and for coastal uh, uh, access. I, I think it's a weird little country. And if those two people can't come together, if the Gambians and Senegalese cannot come together and form a, a, a strong unified nation, it's no hope of the continent coming together. So I hope that's mm -hmm. also on his agenda to negotiate that with the Gambia. But other than that, I'm cautiously optimistic. And if I see him doing right, I will be the first to publicly praise him. And if I see him doing dirt, then I'll be the first to, to call it out as well. Okay. That's real. That's real. And my second question, um, and Skip, I'm also interested in your perspective on this too. So my wife and I, we're, we're socialists and we were having a conversation about, you know, um, celebrities and then, you know, where, where their relationship is to the capitalist class. And so one of the uh, topics that came up was this like, group of influencers so like these social media influencers where they get a certain amount of following and then like they get like certain sponsorships from larger corporations and we were trying to have a discussion around where do they fall in the class structure like are they a part of the celebrity class you know because they have certain notoriety but they don't have any capital like where, where do you where would y'all consider them in this like capitalist hierarchy i think diallo's earlier response of basically if you have the access is because if you are a celebrity you represent the thoughts passions ideas and goals of elites I think influencers do the same thing. Therefore, what is their value to us and our struggle? Like, um, I I just don't I just I just see the value, of it. you know. Like, if you if you on your social media talking about having a soft life and drink this tea this flat tongue tea um if you uh leave, leave tea alone yeah but like you know like what what you you fall on the enemy side and i think it's dangerous to see everybody uh as asset and enemy but i also just think that if you got a million followers and you telling us to drink flat tummy tea and whatever else those people tell us to do about having a soft life i just you you can't be on our side because your actions don't reflect somebody that's on our side because you can't be on our side privately but then publicly not be on our side because what really is the benefit then like your your soft life rhetoric causes more people to go away from the work that we need to do so even if you're giving money to the work from your soft life rhetoric you're hurting the movement because you can't give us enough money to repeat the re to to reclaim the people that you repay so i just you class enemy you know class con 
I appreciate you, Denzel. We we a little over time, so we're gonna try to run through. Sounds good. I appreciate right. it. I appreciate y'all. Stop eating the vegan M and M's, Diallo. Hey, <laughs> and why? Listen, hey, Denzel. Why would I do that? Cause you see, come out. I wish you hadn't answered this question so thoroughly. Hey, you didn't deserve that. You didn't hey, come Denzel. You and your wife, you know what I'm saying? Y'all hit up the email if y'all trying to write a little article about, you know what I'm saying, socialism and how you came to that. Don't let them write nothing. Let me tell you something. Them Justin's peanut butter M&M's, man, they, they not M&M's. I don't know what they call peanut butter bites, but I got a half a bag downstairs and I'm about to go finish that off. Downstairs? Your house got stairs in it? Yours don't? <laughs> I mean, how do you get to the other sectors of your of your estate without stairs what do you have slides elevators that's crazy, that's crazy. <laughs> so we got stairs for the i have to go the, the kitchen is in the in the north wing of the estate so yeah how do you get around your estate q have you been trying to get on all night question comment criticism and you want to tell us where you where you where you calling from yes sir can y'all hear me yep loud and clear. You, bro all right, uh, I'm coming from Dallas. Uh, just to, just to kind of piggyback off of uh, what Roman said. And the yellow, I think it's interesting um, when you used art and how important artists are. Um, it just made me think of like the immediate materialization of, you know, the thoughts that we have towards uh, ideas such like y'all are presenting. I think we're so caught up and I think that's where celebrities get their kind of, I guess, quote unquote significance. Cause we can see the materialization of what they've done. Even with art it's like, if we're, if we have ideas about art it's nothing to go up to the store, buy a couple canvases and the self-expression is right there, as opposed to these real thought provoking ideas where it's like, well, where's the immediate materialization that we can, attach ourselves to uh and i i just want to know um it doesn't have to be uh i guess a, a blueprint but what are kind of like examples that uh y'all might have seen and just like it can be just a small thing of this is what we were able to materialize just to keep the people i guess somewhat in it and involved and motivated hmm. I'm, I'm not really sure of the question you mean just in the sector of art or overall achievement i mean like like when you say because i'm all right to put this in context i got the book um jackson rising redux mm. and i'm like 20 pages in and obviously it's an amazing book but i think the immediate thing is well of course they got to this point but how do you i see point k but where do you start at point a and i think that's where a lot of this discouragement comes from uh, or or maybe just like not being fully committed to it comes from because uh i guess we can have we can picture revolution in our heads but it's like well where where does it materialize and in, in what ways does it materialize so we can stay in it and involved so i just want to know what were maybe examples that y'all saw growing up uh examples that y'all see uh i guess out here that pe people can be inspired by well i have to say revolution starts in the intellect in comprehension and understanding i think the start of 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 material of revolution is is actually um it's not material it's 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 intellectual and it's it's in the the mind and in the imagination I think that um, if you can uh, destroy people's imagination, then you never have to worry about them re revolting. We've had several uprisings and several rebellions, but we don't have revolutions because the intellectual component isn't there. Right. So um, you can have people generally, regardless of their formal education or, or level of understanding or consciousness, can look at an injustice, look at an imbalance, identify poverty, abuse, you know, neglect. They can identify it. But only the revolutionary can only really understand the core 
source of those issues and then conceptualize and, and, and begin to create a blueprint for how to deconstruct the, the relationships, the social relationships and the, and the physical structures that allow for these abuses and construct something that is diametrically opposed to it, a system based on justice. So um, every revolutionary whose biography I've read or I had an opportunity to interact with, and many of them, believe it or not, like did not have to go through something themselves or the police assaulted me or my family was thrown into the streets. It's just the capacity to engage your human intellect and fully cultivate yourself. The word educate means to bring out. And um, Bobby e. Wright said at this struggle right now, the EPA at the our particular position of the struggle is a struggle for the mind of our people. Because that that is the one obstacle that we don't seem to overcome. So it starts with grasping, understanding who you are. You know, consciousness and understanding your relationship to everything else around you and everyone else around you. And then conceptualizing how you take yourself as a person and elevate those relationships to destroy the unjust hierarchies and to construct just social relationship, economic, political, and even intimate relationships. You'll find a lot of so-called revolutionary people, Dr. Fubar, uh, irritated Val Genie, who claim they want to transform and take down the white man and their intimate relationships are toxic, dysfunctional, exploitative. So it's your consciousness realizing that the world is unjust, understanding how that injustice is constructed and sustained, looking at the choke points and the vulnerabilities and contradictions within that system, and then or orienting yourself and organizing with other people who have that realization to attack that subvert it as you build just social relations and then at that same time educating and expanding and recruiting more and more of our people into that ecosystem so i don't know I, I was last thing i was just gonna ask um so i guess from what i'm hearing it's just kind of like continuing to stay in the conversation because i think i think a lot of people are like i'm i'm 28 right uh, and I think my peers, they have a sense of what's going on, um, but it's hard for them to fall back on another framework, like I said, without getting that, without looking for that immediate gratification, which is which is what I mentioned earlier, uh, the materialization of the thoughts that we're having. So I guess from what you're, you're saying is that staying in the conversation about uh, what we want and uh what we want for ourselves what we want for the community around us that's going to lead us to those um those i guess realizations yeah and then of course there is the where you talking material there are specific acts you must take there are certain things you must do okay i guess that's but, what i'm asking okay so that's a different argument whereas first you have to do an assessment you know it's like are you familiar with asymmetrical warfare? I am not. Well, asymmetrical warfare or guerrilla warfare. So okay, so then, yes. That's just a modern way of saying it, a right. less scary way of saying guerrilla warfare. The principles of guerrilla warfare is that you never make yourself dependent on things that can be denied to you. So if you're going to wage war against an entrenched enemy, you cannot depend on machine guns or tractors or anything that your enemy has the capacity to deny you. Or I think Mao said it best, the gorilla is the fish and the people are the water. So you have to become resonate and in tune with your local environment where you live. Right. You'll notice a lot of these pro-black conscious revolutionary people begin to conduct themselves in a way that isolate themselves or exclude the masses of their people in their communities. Their self-appointed leadership. Yes. And so what you have to do it, wherever you are, I know you say where you are. Where'd you say you were? Uh, Dallas, Texas. You were in Dallas. Oh, that's that's not a back of the, You're in a major metropolis, which is a good. 
and because you have a lot of diverse people to get in and, and that is very and i don't mean diversity in terms of various races but african conscious people with various degrees of skill level various degrees of commitment so in a place like dallas which i've never been there so i can't really speak to but you have to first identify the conscious individuals and the conscious uh spaces and the conscious organizations you have to lay out uh um your local plan in terms of what are the immediate concerns and threats and and uh priorities within your community whether those are valid and appropriate and the where you can find people doing the right thing and 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 are have proper positioning you figure out how you can join or feed that and if it is not sufficiently revolutionary or radical you have to go through utilize the organizational discipline to implement to to radicalize that group as you build a cadre within an independent of that group you start to speak at the various areas of human interactions it might be a study group it might be a small uh, uh business cooperative it might be a community garden you start to figure out ways to bring people together to exercise and utilize and employ and dwell within the ideology and values that you have and once you start to have that camaraderie and connection uh, uh, a, a walking group or a bicycle club uh, uh some way an entertainment outlet progressive event promotion these are all things i've done here in chicago in various degrees of success and then you start to identify the opposition it could be the local church local alderman local school council that is imposing reactionary and regressive uh uh policies in the community exploiting or extracting the community it doesn't have to be big it could be one entity one individual and you start to mount opposition and it goes from there and it starts to snowball and it starts to snowball and you might start with a local uh uh, uh abusive pastor or or a corrupt uh city council member or alderman and you'll be getting up to the mayor's office and then you'll be seeing that there's a university with a racist overtly racist program or president and as you start to target these things it is not only creating immediate evidence to the community the power of organizing together under these ideologies and values you will start to expand and then when you're there you start to make national and international allegiances and ties you get a sister city on the african continent you can go to sierra leone and say well hey we've got we know you guys have an agricultural program or a community cleanup or a community health program we want to partner with you and and do a cultural exchange and material exchange and it kind of balloons from there it, it, it the 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 plan of what should be done is pretty clear it's very clear but to get the people to hold to this radical agenda is is where it comes in keeping people motivated keeping the support networks up uh identifying and excluding the toxic elements because a lot of scumbags are going to want to come and be a part of your shit, and right. you got to have ways of identifying identifying isolating and excluding the 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 uh the con the uh reactionary elements so, you know, I've, I've just kind of done this times. I've even written it down. I've kind of written down the roles, the different positions you need to fill uh, and the difference between a formation and a project. And you got to have formations, execute projects and some some uh, and, and, and project leaders versus in your 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 leadership needs to be dynamic. You don't want a central leader or a central leadership because that's how they can come and decapitate you you have to have many tentacles and many, many heads and the heads are interdependent but can also function and fill in the certain roles i don't know this is a kind of like revolution 101 no i love it i love it so but that's that's how you do it but it, it i know it's kind of not the best format to kind of lay this out but this is what you call an open conspiracy where this isn't even something you have to Sneak, oh well we gotta go clandestine and shit and all that this is you know public record and this is something you can publicly assert and you could say openly in the community we're taking power over the spaces we dwell in and people who are in this space that are not acting in the people in our people's interests no longer welcome here they will not allow to be uh, uh unseen and comfortable in this space 
and that's revolutionary but a lot of times people think you know there's a difference between the black liberation army which you don't discuss their movements and agendas versus the black panther party it was a political party so, you know, I, I, and I, I think we should do more talking of the specifics, like what should be done and how to do it on Definitely, the ground. I, but, I, but I it's just, my problem is the ideology is so lost in the I we're so we're losing on the on the ideology that if you can get people who don't grasp the ideology to to carry out these actions, as soon as one person is exposed as corrupt or assassinated and incarcerated or just lose their faith, the whole thing crumbles. Every fucking generation, we have to rebuild these struggles. All right. Because we don't do enough of the ideological work. Yeah, yeah and to, just to add on that, and this is it. I, I mentioned earlier, well, I, I, I didn't catch the whole show. I'm catching the end of it, but I, I was like, that's where the timing of uh, Dr. Umar is real interesting because I, I think everything that's going on right now, I think it kind of pushes us into pan African uh, pan pan Africanism. Mm. But if there's not the, I guess the proper education about it, I think that kind of leads to more of the the comedy aspect of it than the actual power and what can sprout out of that uh and I, I i think and i will hope you would speak to this one day about how uh maybe like the humor of certain things can actually be a detriment to us in the in the long run like well, uh, oh, but, uh i was just gonna say uh like people imitating trump i think that him being him being a funny character kind of is a detriment because it's like oh he's kind of likable he's relatable and i think that ends up having us fall on um i guess bad things like uh not looking towards the new stuff that can come out of that but uh we revert to old ways of thinking because oh this person is funny and that's it that's all i have to say all right i appreciate that i i do think that humor is well there's a difference between you know, in terms of humor, punching down and punching up. I think mockery and 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 dismissal and mocking those who who aren't to be mocked. So when you see somebody may, uh, every time they they're 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 engaged in humor, it's against a vulnerable population or an irrelevant uh, uh, issue versus uh, mocking those in power. So, but yeah, we're gonna wrap this. I do appreciate that, but there's sure. a difference Thank between you guys. a joker Thank you, and a jester as well. So I do think we need to talk about humor, mockery, the, the the legacy of the Joker and the jester and the minstrel. I think those things are all very important. And like you said, we'll bring it up later because I do I do appreciate the role of, of humor and comedy. And I don't understand why people love Dave Chappelle so much. With that, uh, again, I appreciate you, brother. You want to close us out so we can go and get some uh, M&M's? Thank you. That's Amen. it. I'll be looking That's forward it. to your closeouts. And okay, I have, for the first hey, time, yo. you left me unsatisfied. Hey yo, hey, I'm just yo. saying. Usually, you you, you have hey, something to say, yo. but hey, you know, we can call. Hey, hey yeah, yo, okay. hey yo, hey man. All right. I love you, bro. Um, I love you too, bro. Hey, uh, call me tomorrow. On the phones? Yeah. All right. All right, I'll get you out tomorrow. All right. Good All evening, right. everyone. Thanks for being with us. Till next time. Rational Radical. Amen. That thing ain't playing. All right, bro.